Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> I was thinking that how beautiful it looks when the sun comes out and shines on this porch, but also how barren it seems like right now when I had to take all the plants inside in order to keep them warm overnight because this morning we had frost and it's kind of like a freeze warning and unfortunately with the cement, you know, as cold as it is and as, you know, I'm not so sure the plants might not have survived, but just didn't really need to push it. So sometimes I'm a little careful with the plants, so I take them inside and then bring them back out as you've seen how abundant house plants we have because I take cuttings. But you know, that's kind of what you do when you are a Christian. You adapt to your circumstances. God doesn't say, I'm going to make you wealthy and healthy and prosperous and wise. He says, I will be with you in tribulation and be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So you should expect not to be wealthy, but rather to be humbled. You see, a lot of times people get this wrong idea about what Christianity is all about. It's not about getting a wonderful life and living a purpose-filled life or some life that you get to determine who you are based upon what you think you are. But rather, Christianity is about denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus. Some people will prosper. Some people will be blessed because they need to learn something from that experience. But there will be people like me who are poor and needy who will always be poor, that will not be wealthy and rich, as I look at most Christian pastors I know of, and they are prosperous, whether they will admit it or not, yeah. But compared to someone who knows his place in life, who knows his situation, hey, I don't see them necessarily living paycheck to paycheck, you know, or counting the pennies in order to find a dollar, you know, so you can go to the dollar menu. You know, those are the things that I look at at times, you know, or that I have in my mind. Now, I'll admit, I take what I have and I make it look phenomenally as though God had prospered me. And He has, because I enjoy that aspect that nothing I own is really that expensive or that is such a hardship that I couldn't just walk away from it at any point in time. I could just say, hey, <laughs> The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But you see, people that have Harleys or have huge homes or mortgages or all these things they've added unto themselves and their kingdom, you know, they, they have a hard time giving them up. They have a hard time leaving them behind. They have to lock them up. They have to protect them. They have to do all kinds of things that I don't want to. Oh, sure, I could have quit the ministry and went ahead and made money. I could have charged for the ministry and went ahead and made money. I could have taken gratuities from people when I speak and made money. But God said no for me. He said, I have something more excellent that I choose for you than you would believe I would give to any other. And though others will experience it too, it's something that the poor and needy have that would be something between you and I that I would enjoy. And I have enjoyed it. And that's a personal relationship with Jesus in an intimate way that He forgives me of my sins in a very clear and definitive way. He talks to me. He walks with me. He shares with me His heart. He lets me have the compassion I need, but also something I asked for that He has given me. And that's wisdom to know when something's true or something's false. To know when the Scriptures teach something and man is taught something. To be able to balance the right from the wrong and to know the accurate answer. Because the Bible had said to me when I first got saved that there is an answer basically for everything, but there is also a promise we've been given that we should be able to give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within us. And that was one of the things that I clung to and said, God, I want to have an answer for every man's problem when they come to me. I don't want to counsel someone with some gratuity or gratuitous idea of just, oh, well, pray and God will take care of you. Oh, well, read your Bible, God will be fine. You know, oh, well, do this and go to church, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, I wanted an answer to what the actual problem was. And God gave it to me through the years. It took the experiences that He took me through 
to make it applicable that I could use it because a lot of people haven't been through the experiences I have. As a matter of fact, a gentleman the other night I was talking to and I told him that he shouldn't vent all his personal problems on the internet. He should not be posting all of his issues with his filial relationships or his work relationships or even his marital relationships on the internet. And he made an interesting statement was that he came off with the idea that, oh, well, you know, you haven't walked a mile in my shoes. You don't know where I'm coming from. And I said, excuse me? Everyone has a story and you don't know mine. And that's the reality of why I look back on my life and I say, thank you. I don't look back on my life and say, failure, loser, or anything like that. I look back on my life and say, thank you, Lord, that in all that I have experienced, you have used for your kingdom. You have used the experiences of my life to cause me to appreciate where a person's coming from, to be able to direct them in the way that they should go, and to cause them to know a personal loving Savior that has demonstrated the love of God that reached down to a sinful world and said, look, you don't know what you're doing, but I do. Let me introduce you to my Father who is in heaven, and you'll find salvation. And because of Jesus in my life, in all those years that I went through everything that I experienced, I could look at that man and say, huh, you may think I ain't been there, but buddy, I've been there. I paid my dues. I've been up the creek and over the paddle and experienced some things that a lot of people have not and really would not if they had the choice. But I went through it anyways. And that's the thing that God brings us through. He uses your life experiences not so you could be selfish or self-sustaining, but so that you could be selfless and God-sustained. In other words, God wants to be your dependency. He wants to be your sustenance so you could reach out to others who are going through the exact same experiences you are and you could minister to them. Not with your ability, but with God working through you to them. Because God is always looking the whole world over, the scripture says, searching out man's hearts for someone whom he may act strong on their behalf. That means that we don't protect ourselves. God is our protection. We don't seek to assert ourselves. God is our assertion. God is our promoter. God is promoted. And we demote ourselves. We deny ourselves. We humble ourselves so that he can be exalted. And that's where a lot of times American Christianity is really a confusing issue because a lot of people exalt themselves. Oh, they, they claim they're humble, but in reality it's kind of one of those Christian things that in America it's got the opposite of what the Bible says. And that's why you have to be careful very much so in American Christianity because a lot of things that are portrayed as being Christian are more philosophy and humanism and democracy than they are biblical standards that God has given us. They're less about what Jesus said and more about what man has interpreted. And that's why you should always, in everything, in all your ways, acknowledge God and let him direct your path. Because if you don't, you'll be following American Christianity and find out that the American God may not be the God of heaven and earth. It may be the gods of men. And the powers and principalities that are behind America, which have manipulated our society in such a way to cause even Christians to turn away from the living God, might be influencing you in ways that you may have added unto your salvation, things that are just going to be consumed when the Lord judges them. Be careful of that, because we live in the latter days. We live in a time when men are doing their own thing, when they want to find their own way, seek out their own truth discover, as it were, another group of people they could just hide inside. You know, like megachurches. You can hide in a megachurch and never be personally involved. You can never be intimate with people because all you have to do is just keep going. After all, nobody knows you're there. They all greet you and think you care. But the reality is, how many people do you invite to your home? How many people are living a life that you know that Jesus and his disciples live, that they know you when you sin and you know them when they sin? That's the intimacy of the reality of what Jesus said discipleship was. Godly sorrow worketh repentance, not to be repented of. In other words, godly sorrow causes you to turn from what you did to cause the sorrow, and you should not treat that sorrow as something wrong 
put something right. Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Mine iniquities have taken uphold me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore my heart fails. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy. Keep judgment. Wait on thy God continually. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. He heals the broken in heart and binds up their wounds. He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. God has always been about mercy and judgment. His judgment was meant to cause us to come to the place of being broken so we would cry out for mercy. His judgment always brought the nation to their knees so that they would turn to him and find grace in time of need. God's judgment was never about, I'm going to determine your righteousness and make you a wonderful nation and holy and perfect in my eyes. No, far from it. Every time God brought judgment, it was always driving people to their knees so that they could receive his mercy. Because they're hard and unrighteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We do not stand in God's eyes as though we were some perfect creation that he made, but rather we stand as sinners saved by grace. So it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, and by his loving kindness we are restored. So. God is always at work in us, both to do and to will of his good pleasure, causing us to come to the realization that without him we can do nothing. With him we can do everything, but when we go without him to do something, and we don't seek his will first, then God brings judgment upon us. God causes judgment to drive us back to the place of need, of needing him. That's the way it should be every day. We should wake up realizing that we need God. Every single moment of the day, every breath we take, every move we make, every decision that you have chosen to do today should be made with God and with the realization that God wants to receive not only the glory and the honor as though we put our stamp of approval by saying, oh, well, in Jesus' name we do this. No. He wants to tell you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God, to know his voice, to hear him speak, to walk with him today. Today it says, harden not your heart as it says in the provocation, but rather learn to recognize when God is telling you the way to go, what to do, and what to say. Because that's what Jesus said we ought to be knowledgeable of our Father in such intimacy that we only do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So today, choose rather to turn your hearts back to the Lord your God and start your day every day with hearing His voice, walking in His way, and doing His will and not your will to be done.